Bernd Nicolaisen describes his photographic representations as viewing of layers. He explores hidden finds from the history of the Earth, which he finds in seemingly untouched, magical places. What he investigates and abstracts in his work, in collaboration with scientists such as glaciologists, astrophysicists and geologists, is the interaction and interplay of light in and on materials such as water, ice, stone and wood. His project, Zerwon, First Life, is about scientific investigations and their artistic interpretations in the context of the relativity of our concept and understanding of time. So when asking the question of where did the first life come from and how did it arise, those are of course some of the biggest challenges to science. Um, and one of the challenges is that we have a, a geological record that spans to about 3.5, 3.7 billion years ago with good preservation. But before that, the rocks are very seriously metamorphosed, reworked and we can't see the evidence for where life got started. So we have to research the earliest traces of life and then think, how does that cast back in time to where life might have got started? Martin van Cranendonk from the University of Sydney and Kathleen Campbell from the University of Auckland supported him with their knowledge. The focus of Nicolaisen's photographs in Zerwan First Life is on the emergence of first life and the surfaces and structures of some of the oldest rock formations on our planet. Part of the work that we've been doing is to investigate the environment where the very earliest life is found. And it turns out that it's in very shallow water settings, not in the deep oceans. And that's really made us rethink about the origin of life. Did life originate in the deep seas? Or possibly, could it have originated on an exposed land surface? And all the indications from our research on ancient life from Australia indicate that it is very likely to have formed on land, in hot spring pools that can generate geochemical complexity. And it's the mixing of elements and that random sort of splashing and mixing that we think is very exciting in terms of thinking about where life got started. So the question of what did the first life look like depends a little bit how you define life and, and actually nobody can agree on that. So that's still a bit um, difficult to imagine. But what we talk about is the last universal common ancestor, so LUCA, which is imagined to be a single cell from which all of the rest of life has evolved. And that cell must have been able to record information, to duplicate, to replicate, and expand and change and adapt to its environment. And we think, um, you know, there are lots of examples of that in modern hot springs, and in fact, all around the world, bacteria, these ancient lineages called archaea is a special type of, of single cell and those appear to be very likely to be the, the type of first life. 3.458 billion year old stromatolites. It's the oldest evidence for life on planet Earth. Yeah. Made of curling laminations. Yeah. And they're actually slightly wrinkly, which they should be for life. And then between are sand grains. So they were growing in this quiet seafloor environment and then the, a high energy water event brought sand in and drowned them and killed them. And then the sediments and the no more stromatolites. Here in gold, we have what we call the Quatros Amigos, the four amigos of these beautiful little domal stromatolites. This is some of the best evidence for early life on planet Earth. In this project, Bernd Nicolaisen lifts the smallest building blocks of first life to the surface. In doing so, he gives the viewer a glimpse into an otherwise hidden dimension of nature. The inconspicuous becomes surprisingly big.
When you see the hot springs, especially from the air, you can see where the hot vent fluids are coming up and spouting and then pouring down over the mounds and into the pools and out the discharge channels and down into the cooler pools and even out into the marshes. And all along that gradient we see that life is present. It's present as thick, colorful mats. It's present as uh, thin biofilms that sometimes you can only see with a microscope. But life is in all parts of the hot spring system. And so it's also important because as the water is coming out, you see the white silica. In the places where it's dry, you can see the silica has dried and is forming a deposit. And that deposit of the silica, silica minerals, is what entombs the life preserves the life in a fossil form, which then would help us find it perhaps in the earliest life on Earth or on places on Mars where hot water used to flow. The focus of Nicolaisen's photographs in Zerwan First Life is on the emergence of first life and the surfaces and structures of some of the oldest rock formations on our planet. It is exciting that geological time periods are juxtaposed with photographic time spans and that together they create image abstractions of naturally created and shaped rocks that are scientifically explainable and can be assigned accordingly. The earliest form of, of rocks forming right in front of us, the, the white precipitate that comes out if you put the microbial mat on your table for a month, it dries out and it gets covered in the white silica. And that mineral is opal, a non-crystalline or amorphous mineraloid. But if you have that material sit around for a long time, over say thousands to millions of years, it goes through a sort of a series of steps to become more and more crystalline until it becomes quartz. And all the old rocks that are silica rich, that come from hydrothermal environments here, for example, in the Coromandel uh, zone where we have rocks that are 20 million years old uh, and we have hot springs of ancient type, those rocks are all quartz. And then of course when you get to the Dresser Formation and you go to Western Australia where the rocks are three and a half billion years old and they're formed in hydrothermal environments from silica, they are now too as well, they are quartz. And so we are looking at that preservation potential of the microbes that are entombed in the stone as it converts from this non-crystalline opal to the crystalline quartz. Does it preserve the journey? Does it make it through? And so we're looking for the windows in the fossil record where you actually get that kind of good preservation that hasn't been destroyed by other later geological events. Everywhere on Earth where there's life, there's water. Life needs water to continue living, otherwise it dries out and it just doesn't work. So, you know, NASA has this wonderful motto when they're exploring the solar system to look for life, it's follow the water. And that makes good sense because you need water for, you know, the activity of cells to continue. But an interesting paradox is that when you speak about the conditions to get life, water becomes a problem because water diffuses the elements you need to make life. If you have a, a huge reservoir like the ocean and you add some important elements to start to make life, it'll just float away and diffuse and you can't concentrate and make a complex system like life in a very diffuse, you know, enormous ocean reservoir. Nicolaisen's work with the stratograms moves even further towards artistic interpretation of the geological traces found on site. They start where photography reaches its limits. They move away from purely photographic documentary images and are intended to make visible what could exist hidden in the depths of the earth. The subconscious penetrates this image when viewing it, opening up spaces for fantasy and releasing our imagination. So what kind of timeline does it take to change a unicellular organism into a more complex multicellular? Well, there's, there's maybe even two parts to that is what kind of time frame would it take to get life started? Well, we don't know that exactly. We know the Earth formed at 4.5 billion years ago. We know the earliest record of life is 3.7. 
and that's already a community and it seems to be organized. So somewhere in that transition, there must have been, you know, life gotten started. So you've got 800 million years to play with there. And then it took 2 billion years, 3 billion years to get more complex life. So what kind of structures in center give us some kind of feeling about first life? That's an important and a difficult question because silica itself is relatively inert. And we don't think that silica plays a really vital role in creating life. But what's been so important for us in geology is that Sinter preserves evidence of life. The beautiful thing is that it, it's dissolved in water, like, you know, sugar in your morning coffee, it's just dissolved. But as it flows over a surface, the water will evaporate and the silica will fall out onto what's ever there. And so it preserves the textures of life that lived on hot spring surfaces very faithfully. And so in terms of understanding first life, silica is really important because it's the place where we look for that preserved evidence of life. We have to interpret those textures, those colors, find out what the minerals were, and then understand how those minerals were pre precipitated. Because remember, all the material that was alive three and a half billion years ago is now turned into solid rock. And we have to then unpick that rock code to understand what was made by processes that just happened in the Earth naturally, geological processes, just physical processes, and then what of those minerals was caused by the activity of life. And we can see textual evidence of that in the very ancient rocks. And sometimes the different colors provide us a clue of where to go and look in more detail with our microscopes. And so it's very difficult to prove life at the scale of what we can see with our eyes, just on the outcrops. We get a hint of what might be there, but then we have to really use the, the sophisticated technologies on the laboratories to go down into a very fine scale and look at the textures and the changes in the elemental composition that tell us, well, this was probably formed by life. I guess we do need to think about first life because it eventually led to us and we hold the future of the earth in our hands. And so we can learn some lessons from how life took hold on earth, how it became so adaptable, how it became so strong and resilient and yet vulnerable to extinction, vulnerable to environmental change. And so I like to use the idea of first life uh, for us to see that we're connected on a continuum of 4.5, 4.6 billion years, and that it was not inevitable that we got here, but that life continued to evolve so that we could eventually become where we are today. But now the future is in our hands. And so we need to think about where else in the solar system has life evolved? Is there another place we could go? Can we save the Earth that we live on? So I think it's important to think about our, our own history from its beginnings to where we are today, to the future of not just humanity, but the rest of the life on the planet.